Thanks for coming. I want to talk about our vision of what a high school should be. Arinda High School. Arinda is actually an Iroquois word that was shared with me, like so many other things that I've learned over the years, by one of my students. In Iroquois, it has to do with the human will and how we can change the world and impact the world and not be victims of fate. And hopefully, in the next 15 minutes or so, what I described for Arinda High School will explain why we took that name and why we have this particular logo. There's a, a wonderful line by the late great actor Philip Seymour Hoffman in the movie Charlie Wilson's War. If you don't know the story, Charlie Wilson was a Texas congressman, and uh, he was mostly responsible for the United States helping Afghanistan defeat the mighty Soviet army in a war that was so, so improbable. It was a covert operation. And when he was first learning about uh, how, he was gonna, how this was actually going to happen, he talked to Philip Seymour Hoffman's character in the movie and asked him, uh, so who's working on this project so far to help the Afghan army defeat the Soviet army? And uh, Hoffman says, me and three other guys. And it got a huge laugh in the audience, but it turned out that those, those three, and three other guys and himself were the ones that got this all started. And, and, and I was thinking about that when I, when I saw this uh, idea for the super school, XQ super school. And it was actually, I, I first saw it in a, in a Time Magazine article. Actually, it wasn't even an article. It was, a, it was, a, it was an advertisement. And I saw it, and it, it said, we're trying to design a new high school. And we're looking for ideas. And this is something I've been thinking about for 30 years, how school should be different, how it could be better. But I wasn't thinking about myself right away. I just got back from uh, Nicaragua with one of my former students. Uh, his name is Atosh. Went here, graduated in 2010. And I asked him uh, if he had heard about the, the XQ school, and, uh, because he was really interested in school reform himself. And he said, not only have I heard about it, we've already started a team. Me and two other guys have begun. And I said, wow, uh, that's amazing. Uh, can I join? And I became the fourth guy. So me and three other guys are working on this project. And I want to tell you about the other three guys. Uh, as I mentioned, Atosh graduated from here in 2010. He went to Berkeley, was a computer science major. Uh, Carl went to Lindbrook High School in San Jose. He went to UC Berkeley as well. And then Andrew, almost forgot Andrew's name for a second there. Andrew went to Gunn High School in Palo Alto. And he went to Harvard, where he was a math and computer science major as well. And the, the thing that struck me about this group was all three of them had done sort of the uh, typical high achieving, high level high school thing. They, they went to the, this kind of school. Uh, they, they got into the great college. Uh, they had the, the major that would allow them to kind of write their own ticket. Uh, for example, Atosh worked at Google. He worked at Khan Academy. But none of them were happy with their high school experience. All three of them said, when they look back on it, they think it could have been so much better. And these are the people that kind of hit the jackpot. So I thought, well, if those guys were unhappy with their high school experience, and they seem to get all the rewards from having done all the right things, then maybe there's something that needs to be changed. So we started working together. XQ, by the way, is kind of a combination of IQ and EQ, emotional quotient, put those together, kind of like TEDx. What's X stand for? It's always kind of the unknown. So it's this unknown student that we're trying to develop, this new sort of student that goes out into the world and changes things and, and makes things better. And it's a different sort of model for what high school should be. So one of my motivations for getting up here and talking about this today was something that just recently happened in, in one of my sophomore classes. I just happened to start asking, so what, what are you guys going to do over the summer? And somebody said, I'm going to go to SAT boot camp. I said, what, what's that, SAT boot camp? And, and she explained it, and several other kids going, yeah, yeah, I'm going to that too. And it's like, and I, I was thinking about that afternoon. I was home walking my dog, and I thought that they said that SAT boot camp was going to be eight weeks during the summer, five days a week, from 2 in the afternoon to 7 at night. 
And then I was walking my dog and thinking, ah, that can't be right. I must have heard wrong. They were exaggerating something. That can't be right. So the next day I came back and, and asked, is that right at the SAT boot camp? Is it really eight weeks of summer, five days a week for five hours in a classroom studying for the SAT or getting ready for it? And he said, oh yeah, but it's, it, it's also like you could do the eight to one session or you can do a 10 week session, but then you only have to go three days a week. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, that's so wrong on so many levels. This is not how 15, 16, 17 year old high school kids should be spending their summer sitting in a classroom preparing for a test that they think is going to determine their entire future. We need to do something different. And I'm really hoping that this particular talk goes so viral because one of my thoughts, and I'm going to send it to every possible college that I can, is that if any college accepts a student that goes to SAT boot camp, they ought to be on some sort of list for what they did because they're encouraging it. Because I don't blame the students for going to SAT boot camp. I don't blame the parents for sending their kids there because that's what the model is. I do blame the colleges for putting so much emphasis on something that kids feel like they need to do that, which is really probably the opposite of what colleges are looking for. This has got to change. I want to talk about the difference between what's happening in school and what should be happening. And I was reminded of this when I was having lunch with one of my former students not long ago who has going to Cal State East Bay now, and she's telling me how hard she had been working on the, the relay for life, which we just had here last week at, at our school. And they have this all over, and she was doing it at, at Cal State East Bay a couple of weeks ago, and she was telling me about how much work there was, how hard it was, but how gratifying it was, how challenging it was, but most of all, how much she lear learned from that experience of working on relay for life and I was contrasting that to her actual classroom experience because she was a management major, a business major. And she was telling me her actual classes, she was a little bit bored with. There were some things that were somewhat necessary to learn, she thought. But what she really learned the most was from, from working on this. And then, but this had nothing to do with any of her classes. She wasn't getting credit for it. Uh, she wasn't getting paid for it. It was just a challenge she over undertook on her own to learn maybe more, a little bit about business and marketing, but it was just something she had a real belief in because she had lost some people in her family to cancer and, and she wanted to work on this, but she got so much more out of that than the actual classroom work. And I started thinking, we need to flip it around. Uh, we, we put too much emphasis on that book stuff in the classroom and not enough emphasis on this. So this takes like a, it's like on the side and it takes a lower priority. And I have a story about that, uh, a couple of stories. At this school, this last year, they had a canned food drive and we had an activity in one of my classes where we we're trying to raise money and money for refugees coming to the United States and bicycle helmets and bike locks. Let me explain. So we had somebody from the IRC, the International Rescue Committee, come to my classroom and talk about the refugee crisis that's going on around the world. And locally, refugees coming into San Jose and Oakland. And, and we asked, well, what can we do? We want to help out. You know, we don't want to just hear about it. We want to contribute. And they explained that a lot of the guys that come here, and sometimes females, they they have bicycles to get to work. They don't have cars. They don't have uh, uh, licenses yet. For example, one of, the, one of the times they visit, they brought an actual refugee who had just come here recently from Afghanistan. And he was telling his story. He didn't have a car, so he would ride a bike to his fast food job. And they need bicycle helmets. They had bikes, but they didn't have helmets and they didn't have locks. So they asked my students if you would raise money or raise, if you could collect helmets or, or bike locks. So I gave them like two months to work on this project. And of course, students being students, they didn't work that hard until the very end, the night before, they asked their parents, can I have $5 to donate to my class? Or uh, a few people went out and got helmets, a few people got locks. We had a small number of helmets, a small number of locks. And about $1,000 that we raised, mostly because they asked their parents. And I was thinking the amount of effort that went into that project was very small. 
even though I gave him two months and emphasized how important it was. But if I said there's a chapter test coming up the next week, wow, they would have worked really hard. They would have studied them in study groups. Uh, if the harder the test, the more they would have worked. We need to flip that around. I'm not saying those things in the chapters of our world history book aren't important, but what would have been a much more valuable learning experience would have been the actual going out like two people did and recruiting friends and neighbors and one person brought in almost $500 by herself. Uh, another person was able to get several helmets by walking around the neighborhood and, and asking people. The kind of skills you learn from that are so much more important than just reading out of the textbook and then remembering it for the test. This event itself, TEDx, nobody that's working on here, all the, the students that are involved here, nobody's getting credit. In fact, they had to go through some bureaucratic hurdles just to make this event happen but I guarantee you they're gonna remember what they learned from all the experience of putting this event on way more than a typical day in class. And so part of our school mission is to have more of the kind of project-based learning that teaches students real skills and a little bit less of that book learning and at least put the priorities a little different, flip-flopping, as I said. Another thing about our school that we wanna have is something we call guest teachers. And I've been doing this in my own classes for years. And I think it's incredibly valuable. As much as I like to praise teachers and say we do a good job, we don't always do the best job because our skills are limited. For example, I teach government and economics. I have never run for office. I've never held office. I've never been a millionaire. I've never opened a business. I am not the best person to be teaching government or economics. I can do it, but why not have someone who's actually become a self-made millionaire come and talk to my students and talk about, talk about how he or she did it? Why not have someone that ran for office and won and explain how that happened, how a campaign really is? How about real politicians and real business people talking to my classes about government and economics? So I've been doing that. And I think that can be extended to any class. Why not have doctors talk to biology students? I had a doctor in my class once talking about the healthcare system and the Obamacare. Way more credibility than me talking about it than an actual uh, intern, intern talking to my students about it. We've had lawyers talking about the law. Uh, engineers should be appearing in our science classes. Uh, entrepreneurs, as I mentioned, talking about how they started the business. Real artists, dancers, painters, musicians coming talking to the students. And what we found, what I found over the last 10 years or so, is that they're totally willing to do it. Uh, people want to share their knowledge with students. In fact, I've had several times where people have called me up and said, hey, uh, you want me to come talk to your students about whatever that we're talking about at that particular uh, time? And if I meet people out in the world and I say, hey, will you come talk to my students? They'll do it. Why not bring these people into the world? It'd be nice if we could take our students and put them on a bus and take them out around the world and say, here, let's meet these people. Let's go out to the real world and see it. And sometimes we do that. But that's probably not as realistic as just having people come and talk to us in person, learn from real people, real people out in the world doing what these kids are all about to be, be doing themselves someday. Two quick stories from recent one recent, one from a little longer away, uh, further back. Uh, I'll start with that one. Jack O'Connell, who was once a superintendent of public schools for the entire state of California, real big shot, not a name any of my students knew, but he, through some quirk, was going to be in Fremont visiting the school for the deaf and blind. One of my students got a hold of him. He comes to my class. He has a bodyguard. He has a little entourage with him letting the kids know this guy's an important guy, Set head of all schools in California. He comes in while I'm eating lunch by myself. We have a short conversation, and he talks to my students. I'm 33 kids in the class that day. An amazing experience. And not long ago, uh, Steve Huffman, the founder of Reddit, took Bart over here to Fremont from downtown San Francisco. This guy is a multimillionaire entrepreneur, but he walked into school. He looks like a high school kid. Came and talked to my class. 
one on 30, very intimate conversation, amazing. That's the kind of thing that can happen when you start opening up your school to bringing the community to it. We want to redesign the path to college. As I mentioned, we don't think that the A to B to C, straight line, SAT score, number of APs passed, GPA should be the only thing that schools look at. We know that there's so much more to a person than those three things, but that's what most people stress about. We know there's also a change going on. Uh, it's happening, uh, where colleges are looking more and more at uh, how interesting the person is. What kind of things did they do during high school? Did they just sit in SAT boot camp classes for the entire summer? Did they actually go out and do something interesting? Uh, last summer, we went to Nicaragua uh, to work on a school, which is nice to put on your college resume. But more importantly, when you went to Nicaragua, if you're able to have that privilege to do that, were you able to do anything for the people when you came back? Did that start something in your head that said, OK, I'm going to help one student get transportation to high school that couldn't afford it. I am going to help teachers get transportation to high school who have to walk uh, sometimes as much as eight miles just to go teach school. What kind of ideas did you get from what happened to your summer that you're now going to improve the world and make yourself a better person? If a college looked at that, they would find people that are really interesting that they would want at their college. I don't think colleges want people who are just experts at passing AP tests and SAT tests and getting high grade points because they'll come to events like this because it was offered to you as extra credit. We want people to do things like these guys are doing for no extra credit, no anything other than just we want to do something important and special. That's where we're headed. And what we want to do at our school, at Arinda High, is have a model for colleges to look at. We're insisting that our students do certain things so they become interesting, successful, contributing people. At our school, at Arinda High, at any time, you could ask anybody at the school, student, staff, any of these questions, and they should have an answer. The first one is, why are you learning this? So often, if you ask a student why they're learning something, they'll not really know, because it's going to be on the test. Uh, this is unacceptable, as far as I'm concerned. You should always know why you're learning something. And if the teacher doesn't know why the teacher himself or herself is teaching that, then that's a mistake. Uh, the teacher has to plan very carefully, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, about what exactly is being taught. And if there's not a good answer, then don't teach it. And if the students can't answer that question, then they should, that person should ask. A student should ask the teacher, why are we learning this? But if you're asking yourself that constantly, you'll probably be able to figure out reasons on your own. But I don't think we do that enough. The second thing is my favorite question to ask pretty much anybody I meet, what are you working on or toward? What are you working on or toward? Is it just, I'm trying to get in college? That's probably the number one answer for students at a school like this. OK, but then what? If your only motivation is to get to the next level, when does that stop? I'm trying to get in a good college. I'm trying to get in a good grad school. I'm trying to get a good job. I'm trying to get a new, better house, a new house, a, a better car. What are you working on right now that's really important? That's what's important. And number three, how do you plan to use what you're learning to contribute to the world? When I first started thinking about becoming a teacher is because I, I read a book by the late Pat Conroy, just passed away recently. Uh, it was called The Water is Wide. And he had taught at a little island off the coast of South Carolina called Yamacraw. And I don't believe it's, it's named Yamacraw anymore. I think it eventually had its name changed. But the, the island was filled with students who were descendants of slaves. And they had practically no education. They didn't know what country they lived in. They didn't know why there were 50 stars on the flag. They didn't know who George Washington was. And he, he wrote a book about spending a year making a huge impact with this community. 
and he became sort of my mentor. I was able to meet him later in his life. Uh, he was uh, my inspiration to go into, go into teaching. So that's kind of what I thought I would be, that kind of a teacher. And I ended up at a school like Mission San Jose, in the suburbs with relatively wealthy students, all headed to college, very well educated. And I've had a hard time justifying that in many ways. Why am I at a school like this? Why am I not in East Oakland or uh, East Palo Alto? And the way I've been able to get, make that, live with it, I guess, is because of question number three. If every student that I teach that has the privilege of being, as Cory Booker says, being born on third base, then if I can get you to look at your education as not being just about you, but you starting a ripple and doing something important, and if everybody in this room thinks, I'm going to learn what it takes to make the world better, and I'm going to improve it in some way, then that will start the ripple, and that justifies me teaching at a school like this. It's not about you. If you get an education here and, and go to college and get a nice job, then I feel like I've failed. We failed as a school. It has to be more than that. You have to go out and do more for the world than just for yourself. I believe one of the most important things, probably the most important thing, no, without a doubt the most important thing, is learning how to build relationships. It's the difference between a good life and a mediocre life or even a poor life. How are your relationships? And I have learned that relationships take work. It's not something that you put on the back burner that, oh, OK, after I'm done with my homework, after I'm done with uh, whatever else that I really need to do, then I'll go hang out with friends and make contacts and all that stuff. This should be a priority as well. Maybe don't do your homework one night and go have coffee at Mission Coffee. Spend time with other people. Sometimes it's work. Sometimes it's hard. One morning, I asked my students to write a note to someone or write a text to someone and just say, hello, how you doing? Uh, I miss you. I haven't talked to you in a while. They don't take that seriously. But if I say take out a sheet of paper or having a quiz, they'll, take that out. They'll, they'll, they'll do that immediately, seriously. It's like, flip that around. The relationships should be more important than just about anything else. But it takes work. And we want to... We want to get that across. Arinda's not a place where, oh, yeah, you just do whatever you want. No, we do important things, but you have to work really hard at them, including relationships. We believe that uh, there are two parts of health. There's emotional health and physical health, and they go together. We've looked at the, the model of physical education in school, and we know that most kids take PE first year, second year of high school. And they don't take any PE after that, and it becomes something you do on the side. We believe that you should be doing some sort of physical activity 365, all four years. So if that for you is swimming or dance or running marathons or joining some sort of club sport, whether it's volleyball or basketball, we want you doing something physical. We want you moving your body all the time. We know there's a correlation between movement and happiness and joy and we believe those two things go together and we want to redo the model for how physical education is taught how health is taught we look at both sides it's not just physical it's emotional but again those two connect and finally i want to talk about what i've been working on if you ask me that question for the last 10 years i've been working on this book and one of my lessons actually in the book is that pretty much anything that you do that you think is important is going to take way longer than you thought, and it's going to be way harder than you thought. And it's really hard to get that across to people, because one of the things we try to teach in schools is, is cramming and getting things done quickly and easily, but valuing the process and understanding that it takes a long time. So the book that I started 10 years ago, I thought it would be done in a year. And it's at the publisher now, finally 10 years later. And it's called Missing Pieces, 52 Vital Lessons Our Kids Should Be Learning at School But Aren't. And the reason this is so important to me is because I think one of the most important lessons, probably the most important lesson in economics, which I teach, is something called opportunity cost. Which means if we're spending $10 on one thing, it means we can't spend that $10 on everything else, anything else. 
So you say yes to one thing, you say no to countless other things. And I look at that for the way we teach school. We have a very short time to be with our students, and everything that we teach, if I teach one thing, it means I'm not teaching everything else. So we have such a responsibility as educators, as teachers, as schools, to choose things that we're going to teach kids in that limited amount of time. If I'm going to teach this, that means I can't teach anything else. I don't believe any knowledge is bad knowledge. No matter what you learn, it's going to have some positive effect. It's just that some things are probably more important than other things. And that's what this book has been about. That's what Arinda High School is about. During that limited time that we have students, we want to teach them what will most matter, what will most affect their lives, what will most help them, not only help themselves, but help everyone else in the future that they can possibly contact and reach out to and, and touch in some way. And that's my current project, and thank you very much for listening.